Thank you, uh, everyone, for coming today. Uh, my name is Will Guilford, and I'm honored to be a chair of this panel. What we want to deliver today is just a taste of um, kind of what's possible and what our personal experiences are with integrating technology into the classroom, either technologically enabling something that might otherwise not be possible or as part of um, you know, our response to the hybrid challenges. Um, so with no further ado, I'm going to introduce the first of our speakers, and that is Reed Bailey. He is from Systems Engineering. All right, thanks, Will. So uh, we each have a few minutes to share, and then we want to have a lot of discussion and dialogue uh, with y'all. And that's, that's not dissimilar from the class I'm going to talk about. It is an engineering class, but I don't want that to uh, dissuade. <laughs> How many folks in here are not teaching engineering an engineering class? <laughs> yeah, right. So I had, I had a hunch. So let, let me focus on the other dimensions of the class that may have some more similarities for you. Uh, it's fairly large for us, at 120 students about. Uh, we want the classroom to have a lot of dialogue in it. It's not a stand at the board, people write down notes, which is what you might think of when I say engineering. Um, it's it's case-based uh, in that students are doing a lot of cases, actively doing them, not just discussing them. They're doing them in teams, and they're coming to class to make presentations to their clients, essentially, uh, who would be running those cases. Um, and so hopefully some dimensions of that maybe relate to you, uh, uh, even if your hand was up for the engineering part. Uh, I really have one message, uh, and and it, it's that uh, you know technology comes to, comes second uh, for us in designing this course. Uh, we looked at what we wanted to achieve, and some things technology helped us with. A lot of things technology doesn't help us with, and and start you know starting with, for instance we want to have a lot more commitment from the students. We don't want them to be sitting there passively thinking about, well, you know, maybe I'd do this, maybe. We want them to commit to an idea and, 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 and take a stand for a certain perspective, a certain recommendation, a certain thing. Um, and we want them to be engaged in that and to have good discussions around that. So one of the things we do to encourage that is use um, Google Documents polls in class. This is something we've done for years. This doesn't require any technology beyond laptops in the classroom. You don't need a special software package. You don't need clickers. But students can quickly commit to something. Uh, and then you can engage them in that discussion when they get into small groups and be able to really say, well, I thought I should do this. You know, we, you thought we ought to do something else. Our, our objective is to get them engaged. Uh, and the technology is just there to help us, do, help us you know, in, in, in part. Uh, something else that we, re we really want for our students is to be able to access us as faculty, but it's 120 students. And so that, that frequently leads to completely being swamped in email. I mean, I, it's, it's, I get too stressed out, I think, or too, I'm, I'm too concerned about not answering so many emails that I get, and so many are from students even. Um, so one of the things we did for this year about that was use, we, we used a tool called Piazza. How many of you have used Piazza? Or heard, heard, how many of you have heard of Piazza? Okay, so for me, it's sort of, it's, I'm a little turned off by it because it's just a discussion board. You know, what's the big deal? People have been doing that forever. Um, but I would say it's optimized for large classes at higher education. And it really did. It really did save us a lot. One example, which probably many of you can relate to, a student posts a question, says, uh, yeah, I actually forget the details of the question at this moment. You know, are we supposed to do this or are we supposed to do that? Before I even get to go respond to it, which I could do on my laptop or my smartphone or whatever, another student responds with a quote from the assignment that directly answers the question. <laughs> it was great. I mean, I, I, was, I was hooked on Piazza at that moment. Um, the only other two things I'll, that I'll point out, I mean, a lot of people are recording videos with, with Camtasia or Panopto or other things, and we do a little bit of that to make material more accessible, being our objective. But one thing we did a little different with that technology is we want all of our students to be able to present and get feedback on that. And they, they can't. In class, we don't have them all present. We have very small, small numbers of them present, actually. And we dig in deep with those two or three groups and really explore what they've done. So we, we explore the idea of having students record presentations to submit instead of just turning in their documents. Um, and we use Panopto for that, which is software that UVA subscribes to. It wasn't without hiccups, without a doubt, but it was something that that uh, that um, there was a use of the screen capturing technology that that was putting the students on the screen instead of us. Um, and uh, 
before I turn it over, uh, I, 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 my list here, I forgot one additional piece of technology that we used, which uh, enabled us to get peers to review each other. Uh, and a lot of that's the management of pushing paper around. And for a small seminar, that can work. But with 120 students all trying to share their assignments and anonymously give feedback, it, it's a nightmare. Uh, we have used Collab to do that fairly successfully, actually, just posting files under resources. Um, but we found some software that, that'll do this too. There's, it, again, it wasn't perfect. The software we used was was called Praise, P-R-A-Z-E, and and it's a it's a peer review management system that allowed teams to submit work, individuals to give feedback, and then teams to resubmit work a second time. And I think if we used it a few more times, the the kinks would iron themselves out because we would get used to it. Uh, using it just once or twice, um, you know. Just posting files on Collab versus doing that was about about even. So with that, I'll turn it back to Will. Thanks. Thank you very much, Reed. Uh, next up, we have. Excuse me. Yeah, technology <laughs> failure. Love it. We have Alison Levine from the very closely related field of French, where I'm sure you run into exactly the same problems. Hello, um, I'm going to tell you today about um, integrating digital media projects into some of my upper division film and cultural studies courses in French. Um, and keep in mind that my classes are taught entirely in French. All the, uh, all the technology they have to learn in French and practice in French and deal with, with the whole thing in, uh, in French. Okay, so the what was digital media projects in upper division French courses. The why, three, um, three basic objectives. One is making abstract concepts real through hands-on practice. Um, two is there's always in all of our classes a language acquisition um, component. We want our students to become better speakers and writers of French, and we continue working on the language throughout all of our classes, really. And the third one is um, offering students an opportunity for creative self-expression, to I, which I think is really important for keeping them motivated and engaged in their work. The how of the project is a series of filmmaking and digital storytelling workshops that I do in the Digital Media Lab, and I'm really touched to see that some of uh, people from the DML are here, um, which is really wonderful. Thank you so much. They're amazing. Um, a lot of attention in my workshops to quality, um, a lot of uh, attention to, very, to detail, both of production and analysis. And we go back and forth um, very fluidly between critical analysis of professional work and my students' creative work. And I think this attention to quality ends up showing up in their work. Um, so the last thing I wanted to say is that um, the results I'm getting, I'm getting excellent writing, I'm getting students going back over and over again, their drafts, they're doing work after the grades have been turned in. I had this project I want to show you today, which I wanted to show you an example, that's why I'm not really going to say very much, um, is was subtitled by the student who's here today. She's um, Catherine Hall, if you'd stand in the back. Um, she didn't have to be here. She's not getting a grade to be here. She's proud to show her work, and she subtitled it for you. And um, I, the student's engagement and the thank you letters I'm getting, the gifts, the cards, the stories, I don't know how to tell that to a dean or a provost about how much these students really appreciate what they're learning, but it's very powerful. So with no further ado, let's just watch one example.
course that I'm going to talk about that I mentioned a few minutes ago is really part of a longer trajectory with an interest in technology and digital humanities that began when I had the distinguished teaching professor and I started to look at how new technologies could be used not simply to disseminate what we found out, but in fact to find out new things, which initially led to um, the IAS project that I've been working on with Worthy Martin, who's here, for several years in terms of my own research. But I felt a certain frustration that I wasn't able to bring those technologies into the classroom, apart from showing my students what I did, but bring them in in a way so that they could actually use digital technologies for humanities research. And so with the help of a grant from the Academy of Teaching, um, I formed a group, which included Allison, in fact, this year, called in Technology-Infused Learning Ecologies. It's actually just been renamed by um, Jay McCourtney. And um, we met throughout fall semester um, and had a wonderful experience learning about the resources throughout the university from many people who are in this room as we designed courses for this spring and next fall, which in fact integrated um, new technologies into the classroom so that our students could use these tools to do new kinds of investigations. And this poster is just showing you that on Wednesday, May 8th, um, Allison and I will have student work. My students will be there to show you the outcome of this along with um, five of our colleagues who are part of this group. You can just drop in any time between 9.30 and noon to the Digital Media Lab. Now, in my class, um, my class was about um, the Hodge in the Middle Ages. There's a text I've been using for years, which is a travel diary of a Spanish Muslim who goes on Hodge in 1183-1184. And I had always imagined that when I had the time, I would develop some kind of site, maybe a website or a tool that would animate this text, which is very visual in its language. He describes a lot of architecture, he describes people, he describes um, cityscapes. And then I realized that, in fact, what I could do is have the students do this um, with the support of this grant and this work group. Um, and I found out about a new tool developed here through the Scholars Lab, which is part of um, a kind of plug into a mecca called Neatline. And so the class has been basically designing um, digital exhibitions to animate this text. And what I did was pick three sites for them to focus on. Most of them are working in groups. There's a few working individually. Three sites in order to kind of concentrate the efforts of getting the maps geo-referenced and to have groups that could work together. And we ch I chose, um, in consultation with, um, with some of the guys from Scholars Lab, we picked Damascus, Aleppo, and Mecca, um, three of the sites he visits. Um, Damascus and Aleppo were partly because his language is particularly compelling there, Mecca, because it's the goal of his pilgrimage. But also with Damascus and Aleppo, I really wanted them to think about what's happening now to these historic sites, one of which was just in the news last week with the minaret being blown up that they've been studying, as well as the personal toll. So that it's not so abstract for them what's going on with these historical buildings. So the architectural history of Aleppo these are just screenshots from what are digital exhibits. In fact, what happens is you click on one of the sites and then you can get a pop, I should put my glasses on, you can get a pop-up giving you information, images about the site, references to further information. In some place they have, some places have links to video footage, sometimes about current news events from Al Jazeera, sometimes videos that just tell you how these sites have been used historically. Um, this is showing you the markets um, that um, are um, 
part of the heritage of what was really the most important medieval city, certainly in the Islamic world, if not the Mediterranean, what they look like. There's also a click that gives you some text about it, a reference to um, the diarist description, and then they have a link to a news story about the site, about what's going on now, that showed some images of how it's been used, what a vital part of the community it is, its historic significance, because it's a World Heritage Site, as well as footage of what's happened to this site um, more recently. Um, so there's been a variety of things the students have tackled in this, but it's been a way for them to really um, animate the text, to understand how these cities they're studying continue to be relevant and have a kind of ongoing history um, into the present. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, next, I'm going to say a few words. Um, I'm from Biomedical Engineering. And uh, down below, I'm kind of totally ripping off a joke that uh, Reed Bailey had planned, but um, where you know one of the repeating themes here is technology. But I think what you're seeing it's really technology in service of education, and not just using technology because everybody says you're supposed to. Um, what we did in biomedical engineering is um, you know, we've been doing things like uh, doing hybrid courses and flipping lectures and stuff like that for a very long time. And, but we really wanted to do something completely different. And what we did was taught an engineering course, in this case, in case the course Biomaterials, which is this bizarre mix of biology, chemistry, material science, mechanics, all in one big heap. It's tremendously broad, and I will say straight up, you will see no beautiful movies or pretty pictures because the pictures that come with Biomaterials are amputations and crushed legs and other disgusting things that the students ate up. I won't expect you to. Um, but what we wanted to do is give them a broader approach and really put education in their hands. So we taught it using the Socratic method, which is something that my colleagues in law think is a little bit funny because they've been doing this for a little while. Um, but in the sciences and technology, it's by and large unheard of to do a course taught entirely this way. But what technology did is let us do this. So we started with just this basic idea. We are going to start with case studies, which as we all do, say with Colab or something, we'll put them online. Students then need to go and prepare. And, and by the way, these case studies are just clinical cases. That's it, just clinical cases, where some material was used in a the solution. They go and they prepare however they want. We give them no instruction. We give them no recommended text. We give them nothing. Just go have fun and they go out and they do it however they want. And then they come to class prepared for in-class dialogue in the traditional way of one instructor and maybe a small collection of students there in the hot seat for the day and that day and they don't know what's coming. So how did we build upon this to make it make sure that everybody had adequate coverage and to make this kind of thing possible? Well, one thing we did is we used the tool Now Comment, uh, which is available here, developed here at UVA, available here at UVA. Um, as a tool for delivering these case studies, where you can put case on one side and then you can get even sentence by sentence or paragraph by paragraph comments from students on the other, the idea being many hands make small work, right? So that's number one, they get that online. Second thing being we want to make sure everybody did enough stuff every day so that they aren't just, oh, I just did my hot seat day, I'm going to blow things off for a few weeks. No, we start every day with a quiz and we happen to use um, um, as pre-described, we use an online clicker-like system. So again, it's a clicker system without the stupid clickers. They show up with a laptop, a smartphone, whatever they want. If it can view the web, it can run it. This, by the way, is a picture from the day. This is the final exam in another 122 student course that I teach, where they just do it all online and they get their scores immediately. Okay, so there's, there's no manual grading involved at all. That was nice to make sure everyone was keeping up. And finally, we told them, you do whatever else you want to do. It's not possible to cheat in this class. Other than looking over each other's shoulders at the little quiz, you can't cheat. Prepare however you want to. Ask your uncle if you want. I don't care. And so they chose their own online tools. And they chose things like Google Docs. They love it. That's what they're familiar with. They spent a lot of time on Wikipedia. No big shock. But you can't stop there. They ended up at places like Google Scholar. But here's the really remarkable thing. It's not so much, hey, here are all my fancy online tools. It's what the students chose to do when being given complete freedom to do whatever they want. They chose not to use the commenting tools of Now Comment. They didn't want to. They used it for a day or two, and they quit. Comments dropped to zero. 
Um, they chose to meet face to face. That's what they wanted. They wanted the face to face interactions. That was their decision. Um, they chose, uh, and and again, it's the, the other interesting interesting outcome of all this is number one, I had the most fun teaching a class I have ever had in my life. And in a field like biomaterials, where it's not just you know it's not it's not uh, coming in with your opinions and defending opinions so much it is as really getting into the heart meat core of the knowledge and science and engineering applications that are there. You can't just rely, you can't just walk in with your personal knowledge. You have to have information there at your fingertips. So they're all sitting there skimming and searching and reading as fast as they can during class to try to make sense of it all. That was wonderful and it was great for me. They covered an enormous breadth of things. That was an amazing outcome. Um, and what really blew me away was you get to the end. Oh, here's another interesting factoid. First day of class, enrollment, 76. Second day of class, enrollment, 56. A lot of them just did not want to do it this way. There was a lot of resistance. Comes the end, half thought it was the best educational experience of their lives, half hated it. But in the end, now I have student after student after student coming to me, I want to take biomaterials, but only if it's taught that way that I heard about. They're given some time, they figured out, this is a special way to learn. And the final interesting outcome, I have lost count of the number of faculty who, you know, again, we're here today talking about how to drive, you know, learning forward and how to use technology. And I have lost kind of the number of colleagues who, when told about this, say, oh, well, you should turn that into a textbook. All right, so enough said about that. So now I want to turn it over to our uh, technology guy, John Payne. I'd like to talk to you about a program that was started in our school by Gail Hunger, who um, wishes she could be here with you today. But it's a program that we call TEL, or Teaching um, or Technology Enhanced Learning. And it's a, a program that we put together to work with our faculty. So it's a little bit different bent than what you all have talked about today and was talked about in the face-to-face, -face, which is actually what's going on in the classroom. But what we're doing in the um, in the time ahead of the classroom to work with our faculty to think about integrating technology and, and how it might work best for them. It was an opportunity for us to kickstart some of what we've been doing for, gosh, I guess since the early 90s and even before that um, in a distance learning program that was done in satellite and so forth. It was an opportunity to engage with the faculty and to design and develop exceptional online courses as, as these people began to think about them. It, the, the TEL program reflected a lot of the curriculum that we have in the School of Continuing Professional Studies. So it's uh, across a wide variety of disciplines, procurement, leadership, poetry, finance, cybersecurity. Uh, the amazing thing was is that it all worked and, and the programs that we were able to engage these people in um, helped to, to focus their thinking in these areas and the techniques worked across them. It was a very team-based model. We couldn't have done it without the rich resources that are available here at the university. This, this slide is a shout out to all of the folks that touched our program. Um, our instructional designers had to work very closely with these folks and their, um, their uh, emotion and, and, and support of the program was, was just incredibly helpful. Um, what we tried to do was to enhance these courses or imagine enhancing these courses through the use of technology. And, and they did this through uh, working with our instructional design team that helped them think about all of the different um, tools that were available um, to, to help them choose the most effective tools and the ones that would work the the most elegantly with the student outcomes that, that they had in mind in their program. Our faculty, kind of the what of it was, is that as we looked for people to participate in this program, we were asking folks to consider redesigning their teaching methods and, and their goals with, with technology in mind. We asked them to explore um, potential for specific instructional technology applications, some of the things that, that folks talked about around the table today. Um, we asked them things that they did in their face-to-face -face classrooms that they didn't think might be able to be accomplished through a technological mechanism. And then we worked with them to find those and with our partners around grounds to do that. 
And all along, it was to look at how technology could enhance the learning process to improve the effectiveness of their teaching and the authenticity of, of the experience that the students had. Some of the expectations and outcomes that we looked for them as goals in this project was to either take a course that they were already doing or a course that they hoped to do and, and think about how they would use it in this format. Um, we asked each of them to participate in individual counseling with our instructional design team who then brought them in contact with many of the resources that are available around this room today. Um, and then to participate in three live sessions where all of those different disciplines came together um, so that they could share what they learned and how they were adapting their teaching to an online format and also learn from, from others. We also asked them to be available for other faculty in their program. We're looking at ways to um, raise the, the presence of, of online learning in our school and these people became faculty mentors in many ways. They're the kind of the folks we hoped that would be the go-to people that um, other faculty would ask about how things worked and, and, and how successful they were. And um, we also asked them to present at a, a yearly conference that we had for our school that, that talked about integrating technology into the classroom. So I guess the shameless self-promotion part of my piece today is, is to tell you that we're going to start this cycle again in the fall. And uh, if you want to stop by during lunch, I've got some handouts about how you might be able to take advantage of some of the things that we've learned and, and how your faculty might as well. And uh, this is Gail's contact information. I'm kind of her proxy today, and I would ask you to uh, reach out to her if um, we can add any additional detail to what I've talked about today. So thanks. But of course, this is all supposed to be about you. So do you have any questions for any of our panelists today? Several, several speakers this morning have mentioned the program Neatline. I just wonder if you could say a couple sentences about what it does and if it could be used outside of an architectural um, environment. Um, it, it wasn't designed for architecture. Um, if you go to neatline.org, it's an open source tool and there are sample exhibitions that um, show maps of Civil War battles related to diaries. Um, there's one about um, geography instruction. There's one that shows um, kind of view shed um, tools that have it. It's just that when I was shown it, since I work in architecture, I could immediately see how this would work. What Neatline um, lets you do as a tool is show change over time, which is really valuable for what we do. Hence, as you, if, if those were active, as you slide along a timeline built into the program, you can actually see a city plan change from Greek, Roman, medieval, into the modern period. Um, you can see different iterations of the buildings. Buildings come and go according to time, which is part of the way we think about architecture as a narrative. Um, so for me, that, that makes a lot of sense, or for my colleagues doing site analysis and things like that. But you'll see there's all different kinds of exhibitions um, on that um, neatline.org site using it in completely different ways from the way I used it. I didn't use Thank Neatline this semester, but I remember seeing, we, we had a workshop on right. it last semester, and one of the things I was, re the aspects of it that I was really impressed by was it can handle ambiguity in dates. Mm. Dates we're not quite sure of, dates that might be literary in nature and might not have happened in historical time, so I thought that was a really um, interesting feature of Neatline. I mean, I don't think they were thinking about, our, the people who designed it are just over there, <laughs> you know, you can go talk to them in scholars lab, but they weren't thinking about architecture when they designed it, they, you know, and they weren't thinking about her text. There's just all kinds of ways it can be used. It's basically a collection tool for representing items you collect visually within this format that lets you show change over time, I would say. Um, different kind of question. Do you think the students in your courses ought to get more credit hours for your courses, um, because the expectation of work outside the classroom is perhaps higher, as well as work inside the classroom. Uh, it's a question that challenges one of the fundamental structures in the college, 
which is five courses for three credits each, which I personally think is um, the kind of credit hour system you would create if you were just exchanging information and not doing what you're all doing. Have you changed the credit hour? <laughs> you? All right. No. <laughs> Do you think the student's work is valued to the extent that it should be changed? Um. Let me take a, a little bit of a stab at this one. I wouldn't say, I think what's happening here is where simple, is what technology is doing is it's changing the nature of the work that is done and when. Are you, I mean, in the classic flipped model, all, you know, what's really happening is class time in some sense becomes about doing homework. And um, what used to be homework time now becomes about watching a lecture. That's the original flipped model, and I actually believe it was first implemented by K through 12, not at, in higher education at all. Um, so that, that's just swapping times. And I think to a large extent that's what's happening. It's not just a matter of swapping times. I think we're starting to see just a change in the type of work that is done, not necessarily a, oh my god, I have to do so much more. I don't think I'm seeing that at all. And in terms of <clears throat> the response of the students, I haven't been getting so much a matter of, gee, I ought to get more credit for this. I think it's really that they have, they gain a new perspective on what their own education is about. Um, if I may, I actually have a, a question uh, for the panelists, which is uh, very near and dear to my heart. We, we have classes around here where you know, so many, use, of, use of so many of these tools is required in one sense or another. Um, you know, you are you know, it starts with you're required to submit your assignments to the call lab. It becomes much more, uh, you know, seemingly, almost seemingly outlandish ways. There, there's a course that's taught here where you're, a, a, you have to come to class in second life. Okay. Think about that. So that's almost the opposite extreme of, of requirements of use of technology. So, it, you know, where, and, you know, we're talking really about transforming the classroom experience. So. To what extent are you requiring, or do you think technology should be required uh, by the students in their day-to-day -day scholarly use, versus how much of it should be about yet granting the students flexibility in their own education? I wish I could. Um, I mean, I think a lot of what we require students to do with technology, you mentioned Collab. Um, <clears throat> let's say submit assignments. That has nothing to do with learning. That has to do with streamlining and, and making our lives easier. And to give them variety of well, you can turn in however you want. You know, is is going against that objective. Uh, in, in places where the technology, I mean, so clearly that's 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 going to be some of the work that we do. Is is the reasons we use technology is is other objectives than than um, it may be to get everybody to do it the same way, so that it is easier for us. I think Piazza is a good example of that. You cannot email me a question. You have to post it on Piazza. I will not accept it on an email, or I'll accept it, but I won't read it. Um, I haven't gone that far, actually, but I know instructors will. It doesn't mean you stop having office hours. It doesn't mean you, you kill the face-to-face -face completely. It just means if you want to talk to me remotely, you need to do it through a limited source, a limited set of options, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you this one. Um, that's very different than sort of the creative opportunities y'all were giving students to submit assignments and explore sort of a way to a way to represent their knowledge in new ways um, than sort of course management technologies, which I think that's not true for all the ones that I was using, but in terms of Piazza, you know, in terms of, um, you know, um, the, the peer review system that we used, that was a, is, is much about course management to allow me to do something that has been proven to be effective, more interaction with faculty, more peer review from each other than it was about giving a new creative outlet for them to represent. And on the creative outlet side, it would seem like giving them, like as you said, the flexibility to submit it with technology or without technology might be more of an appropriate uh, venue for that. So uh, it certainly it's not a one, one answer you know, kind of question. Um, the, the other thing I would say, I mean, my students were required to work in a group and do a neat line exhibition. And some people took the class because they actually did not care at all about Medieval Hutch. They just wanted to learn how to do this tool because they'd heard about it. 
I know that there are people in the class for mainly a couple of grad students. But the other thing that um, that I used after these discussions we had in our work group was um, I had conventionally had people write responses to the readings every week, hand them in either in papers or they could email them to me to read before class. And um, after talking to some other people in our work group, I decided to do a Tumblr site, as someone else mentioned, um, which in, in, ended up being very liberating for them. I think if you, uh, we'll have it up at this, this session on Wednesday, but all kinds of things came up on this site. I mean, there were um, news footage, frontline episodes. Um, one of the students who's um, an observant Muslim in the class did a whole presentation about clothing and explaining clothing. Um, there were just all kinds of things came in, in addition to the responses to the reading, kind of expanding on that in a way that I felt um, gave them a chance to do so much more than turning in a conventional response. It was really very liberating for them. So, so I actually believe very strongly that one of the things we're doing uh, with our liberal arts education is um, students should be producing new knowledge and there's nothing new about that. Um, we've thought for a long time that students should be able to express this new knowledge in oral and written forms. I believe now that students should also learn to express this knowledge in digital formats because I think it's an equally important um, form of discourse in the society that we live in. So, um, yes, I do think it should be required. And the, the big, when I say that, and as soon as I say that, the big hundred pound gorilla in the room is accessibility, which is a huge issue for um, how to make sure that these kinds of assignments are accessible to all students. And I worry a lot about that, and I do not have a good answer. Um. Do you see your students using your approaches to media and the tools that you've introduced to them uh, in their profession or in their field, uh, or is it confined to academia? It's, it's absolutely about the profession and the field. I want my students to be creators, not just consumers in the digital environment. I'm pretty sure, my, particularly my architecture students, will be using it in the field, and some of them have started applying it to their more professional courses already, so. But also the, the liberal arts students who come in from the college have talked about once a training to be a school teacher and she talked about using this in her classroom when she teaches. So I, mean, I might add a new, a new kind of tool on the table that I didn't mention earlier, which are collaboration tools that we've used for a long time. And they're undoubtedly gonna use team-based collaboration tools, whether it's an open, an open, freely available one like Google or whether Accenture has developed their own tool that they have to use they're gonna be using those kind of distributed dis team collaboration tools when they, when they go work. So to not give them exposure and, um, and th th those are the things though in class that, that they use anyway, as Will said. Google Drive, SkyDrive, Dropbox, you don't need to tell them to go use those. They, they are learning how to do that just by putting them in the right environment, giving them the right kind of questions where they have, where they're, if they don't do that, they're gonna be at a big, a big challenge. The other kind of things like using online discussion boards, using peer management system, that's not a professional skill for them, but being able to critique their peers' work is definitely a professional skill that's gonna be valuable. Um, I'd like to just kind of maybe uh, differ at least on one small point, which is, you know, they, they do, I think students by and large do now have a strong sense of here are the tools they know and they like frequently because they know them and they're familiar with them. It's a comfort zone. Some of the, there are key tools that would benefit them greatly that they have never heard of. Second year students, at least I know in engineering, have never heard of reference management software, okay? But now it's free. And if you teach them how to use it, take 10 minutes in a class, teach them how to use it, I guarantee next year you will get emails back, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's the best thing ever created. So I think that there are things that we can still deliver to them that, are, that we deal with every day that they don't necessarily know. I, I guess I have the microphone, so um, <laughs> one of the, uh, one of the um, sources of resistance to introducing technology uh, on the part of faculty, and I'll speak personally, is that I feel like I don't know enough. Um, so the question is, how much expertise do I or does any faculty member need to have in order to start introducing the, this technology into the classroom in order to have students do assignments using technology. It's the same answer as it's always been, one day ahead of your students. Yeah. 
I'm always one day ahead. <laughs> so I do think you need to have a little bit of something, but not much. I think it's small steps. And I, the one thing I, I believe is that you can't just assume your students are going to know how to do everything because there's this myth of the digital native, and they don't. There's a lot. There are a lot of things they don't know how to do. Um, we have amazing faculty development resources here at UVA to make those small steps yourself as a professor. And um, if you want to, you know, you can get started with great support. Um, part part of what I feel like I'm modeling is figuring it out. You know, I mean, there's a certain, I mean, it's not like I didn't know anything about this, but I'm by no means an expert. And partly it was, okay, I can't figure this piece out. Where do I go mm -hmm. to get help? How do I go through it? And there was this day where there was this kind of general level of panic when they were in workshop working on their things and they couldn't figure things out. And I, I just stood up and I said, we're just going to breathe. I said, I really don't know how this is going to turn out. They just developed this tool. No students have made anything with this before, but I think it's going to be really great. And we just have to go for it. And we're just going to see what happens, you know? And they kind of all calmed down because it's not like I had an expectation of the product because I don't really, you know, I mean, they have done great things, but I didn't, I wasn't sure how that would work out. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon uh, for this session. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm really going to keep it uh, very short, and uh, we could talk a lot. You know, we went into the Coursera uh, partnership uh, in large part uh, for two reasons. One was because we had academic units clamoring to go into it. Um, so the the the, the push to partner with Coursera and to start exploring the world of MOOCs uh, came first and foremost from uh, Darden and from the college. Uh, and there were faculty who were eager to participate in it and the deans wanted to, wanted to try it and so uh, we did it. Uh, the second main reason why we did it, and it's the way I think you have to, you know, it is, uh, right, right now, it is all MOOCs all the time, it's hysteria out there, right? Um, now, at our, so people often say that, you know, technology, when it comes in, people overestimate the impact of it, and over the long haul, they underestimate it. There's also, I think Gardner talks about, you go through the hype cycle and then through the trough of, of disillusionment, and then somewhere on the other side, the, the, the end point is somewhere between the, 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 the hype cycle and, and down in the trough, but different from where you started out. If you look at, even within the last week, at what's happening in the press, around MOOCs, you see the same thing. You see the disappointment starting to come in, or at least serious criticisms coming in about the MOOC movement. All I would say right now is, is that we did it because we thought, what a great platform to experiment with. Not for revenue, not to create a degree, not to overturn the whole world order, but because this was a great platform to, to experiment on, and we had faculty who were interested in it. So the last thing that I would say by way of introducing our panel is, one of the great fortunes for me is that over the last six months, I've gotten to meet regularly with these folks to talk about teaching. Uh, so before I came to Virginia, I was the uh, undergraduate chair in the psychology department at the University of Michigan for a decade. Uh, I used to teach uh, intro psych to, at that time, what I thought was huge numbers, 1,200 students. 30 TAs, and I thought that was really, really impressive. That'll be blown away by today's numbers as they talk about their experiences. But I spent a lot of time uh, talking with faculty, engaging with faculty around teaching, and how do you get a conversation going, and how do you really engage with it? Never in...
tech geek. I'm actually not very good at with technology. at UVA to incorporate the MOOC material. In some ways, from an analytical and intellectual point of view, I think actually the redesign of my residential course is the more interesting conceptual problem for me than the adaptation of my course for the MOOC format, although I'm very proud of that and proud of the way that's gone. So that's the only thing I want to talk about is, is the course redesign of the residential course. Now, the standard model for a course like mine, this is a course in modern world history. It's a 2,000 level survey course. So I said the standard model, genus, arts, humanities, social science survey course. By the way, most MOOCs and most of this space is occupied by STEM courses. And STEM courses are highly susceptible to this format in various ways. Uh, some of the, uh, what Mitch and I have done, and actually what Michael has done to some extent, is a little bit uh, different than the standard model. Now, so things you need to know and think about how to design a course like mine is the goals in a course like mine, number one, is there is just a lot of just sheer knowledge transfer. It's not so much a skills acquisition course. I am not teaching people how to do computer programming and then involving them in problem solving exercises to see whether they've learned how to do the programming. So this is a lot of knowledge transfer and what I call field literacy or cultural literacy, giving students historical literacy. Second, they're acquiring techniques for and habits of historical analysis, direct experience with historical source material. Therefore, but it's not a course that usually has a big emphasis on problem solving and applications. A, a history survey course is not a course that has that emphasis. So what I want to introduce you now is the ways in which my course was redesigned in contrast to the way the standard model course of this kind would be delivered. And I'm going to call your attention to nine aspects of redesign, some of which are subtle, but very important. So standard model, all of you know this, right, is sometimes mockingly referred to as sage on a stage. Instead, they get the lectures through 92 distinct video presentations, all prepared in advance. And the manner, it's, they are not taped classroom lectures. The, uh, the way the camera is set up, it's as if they're sitting across the table from me in my office. And actually, literally, I turn my office into the studio for this purpose. Standard model, and again, you know this, it's just like what I'm doing now. I've got my technology and I'm managing the media extemporaneously as I'm talking and all of you have had those experiences where you're flustered because something doesn't work and you have to learn how to manipulate it all you know, while doing everything at once. Revised model, therefore, is since it's more prepared, you can do much more elaborate integration of media including uh, um, inter use of interactive displays and other things that I simply don't have the bandwidth to be able to do extemporaneously while I'm also lecturing from a podium. Standard model, your lecture material must be packaged so that it fits into two 50-minute time boxes. <clears throat> so it's basically two topics, 50 minutes each, whatever would be the natural organization of the material. Revised model, topical presentations viewed on a student schedule in varying lengths, from as little as eight minutes to as much as more than 40, depending on what the topic requires. The total time per week varies in the presentations. 
100 to 200 minutes per week, averaging about 130, which is actually some more time per week than I would have been allowed to spend in my lecture time boxes. Standard model, the students basically get their one chance to, to capture the professor's wisdom. They either take good notes or they don't. They either, they either missed it or they didn't. Revised model, they play the videos again, they slow it down, they speed it up, they study maps, and they do, and they do this. And indeed, in my case, they can even download my transcripts, which we're obliged to provide for ADA reasons, and actually use that as an aid to note-taking. But there's enough media in there that the transcripts don't sub. Your assigned reading, this is uh, an intricate point. When you assign reading for the standard model class, your reading is geared to the one or two blocks, or it's just a weekly assignment. So your readings are in those clumps, like here's the 180 pages. Revised model, you actually can cut your reading assignments up and tie them into the individual topical presentation, as many as 92 slices. Therefore, what they're doing, if you think about it now, is integrated homework in which they're reading the particular portion of the reading germane to the presentation, watch the presentation, and they can do that together at home as an integrated kind of study experience that now is, uh, is, doesn't exist in the standard model at all. In fact, as you know, most of your students read asynchronously with your material often bunching up the readings around the midterms and finals. Standard model, the grad students are the ones on whom you rely to further explain and follow up on your material. Revised model, I do that. So they, you know, the, the, the expensive guy that the university pays all the big bucks to, that's the person who does the follow-up explanation. I cut my class in half to do this in two segments, so the full 120-person class actually never meets in plenary session. Standard model, you test what they've been covering in the lecture usually only two or three times per semester, your midterms and your final. With this, they get a no grade question on each presentation 92 times, and they get weekly graded quizzes online, so they're being tested on their recall 14 times with cognitive effects. Standard model, ditto for the readings. You test their recall and understanding of assigned readings only the two or three times per semester, and they tend to read asynchronously accordingly. Revised model, we test the readings 14 times. This is not done online. This is done with another design wrinkle in which I run a clicker response system and I design questions from the assigned readings so when I meet with them following up in person, I administer clicker quizzes on the readings which are then assessed 14 times. By the way, I, uh, clicker, uh, clicker uh, quizzes are commonly used at UVA in the sciences. I'm the only history professor who uses this system. And I, and I found it kind of scary when I first tried it last year. Standard model, students may do research papers in a course like mine, but it's rarely integrated into the classwork. Revised model, because I have pulled what the TAs usually do into what I do, I have now released that time to create a whole different kind of history lab that their research papers plug into and that then is actually integrated fully into the course. Now, <clears throat> issues. So those are the nine design features I wanted to single out. Issues. Faculty workload. You see here, huge front loading in the workload. Huge. Uh, by the way, my estimates, turns out coincidentally, other people around the country are encountering very similar numbers. And there are some other issues that you can see. I want to focus a little more on student workload. Uh, let me just walk you through this, because this is very interesting. First, how much should our students be working outside of class? Well, we actually have a guidelines on this for accreditation from the Department of Education, and they're actually codified in university policy. 
And they are, if it's a three credit class, they should be working six hours a week outside of class. In a four credit class, that would be eight hours a week. So you got that, the federal standards, the university standards are six hours a week. We actually have data on what the students are actually doing, they tell us. In large lecture history courses in spring 2012, this is my second bullet, students self-report that their average classroom activity outside of class was 3.78. The, the required minimum, minimum guideline is six. The students self-report 3.78. I do not think on average the students understate how much work they're doing. So you can, now, by the way, when I did this last year, they reported my, my class at six, and therefore they felt like they were working 50% harder in my class than they ordinarily were in others, and I was at the university guideline. Now what happens in the online setup is this is actually intensified. The design is successful in getting students to work more. In my class, I've just completed a, a, a survey, anonymized survey, they self-report that in the current design, they're working seven hours a week outside of class. Now that's a four credit class. The nominal guideline then is Shea should be doing eight. They self-report doing seven. But now think about this. They self-report seven. The university, the, the norm of expectation for all the courses around them are about half that. They therefore experience this as this is a damn tough class with way heavier workload than my other courses. Now, by the way, I, do, my, I don't take a snide attitude, you know, like, well, then you should learn to work harder. It's the issue is more interesting and complex than that. You see, because their expectations infect the whole way they've organized their lives. So when you hit them with a class that has twice as much workload, even if it's in compliance with some guideline that they've never heard about and regard as surreal and fictional, you hit them with that, and it, 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 has a, it discombobulates the way they've been used to organizing their lives around their habitual expectations. So it's not just enough to then, I can't just point to university guidelines and say I'm great. I have to think hard now about what I'm doing. I either have to reduce my workload to conform with their expectations or hold it and change their expectations consciously. But this to me suggests a wider issue for the university is, is the university happy with the level of work students are doing, at least in the large lecture courses in my field? And I don't know what the numbers are for other areas. The university has them. Um, I mean, are we, and if we want to reset the expectations, should we move then to a norm of instead of five courses a semester, a norm of four courses a semester? Which ties into some broader general education issues that people are conscious of in the provost's office. Finally, just to wrap up, um, what's the overall assessment of whether this, this has worked? We can only try to, this is not a course that's very conducive to the kind of double-blind experiments using objective standardized exams used in, a, say, a course like circuits and electronics. I, I can't do that in a class like mine. So the best I can do is basically gather qualitative anecdotal research evidence. Um, now, of course, the, the faculty team assessment on the new design is highly positive. Indeed, my head course assistant took the course as a student and uh, in the old version and finds the difference simply enormous. In addition, Marva Bennett very kindly organized a TRC group to conduct a teaching analysis poll on this class with complete, with uh, pretty much 100, nearly 100% response rate. I think Marva and I have gone over the report. It's been completed. I think we both regard the report's conclusions as very positive. That is, uh, the report appears to suggest that the students, according to this teaching analysis poll, found this design superior to the standard model. Even though they complained about how hard it was making them work, they said it had a number of attractive features in that they learned a lot more and they liked the way it helped them learn. And then finally, uh, I'll get more information from the student course evaluations. I've bribed them with a few extra points to turn in their evaluations to try to lift the response rates, but I don't have that data yet. That's my report. Okay, great. Thank you. 
So I thought I'd begin uh, just quickly with my journey to how I came to be teaching a MOOC with, uh, with Coursera. Um, I'm a little odd in that the videos that form the backbone of my course were actually created about a year and a half ago. Uh, I teach at the Darden School, and if you're not aware, the Darden School uses the case-based method, Socratic method for teaching. Uh, we, we basically, we don't lecture. So I had created these series of video lectures as supplemental materials for my core MBA course on strategy that our, that our students go through in their first year. And so these were materials that they consumed before they came into the classroom as, once again, supplemental for the discussions that we would have. So uh, first thing that happened to me, I was actually uh, uh, approached by another platform called Udemy, uh, who was running something called the Faculty Project, where they had approached uh, 20 or so faculty to put course materials on their platform, and uh, saw this as kind of a, a low-cost thing for me to do, since I had already had it kind of in the bag with the videos. So I did do that. Udemy is a little different than Coursera in that it's a asynchronous um, courses as well as asynchronous delivery, meaning that there's no beginning and ending to the course. There are just a series of video lectures that are available that at any point in time you could register and take uh, and watch those, those videos. So then when the Coursera opportunity came about a little bit uh, over a year ago, a little less than a year ago, uh, once again, saw this as an opportunity to uh, leverage a resource I had already created, and I was also very interested in kind of some of the differences the Coursera platform uh, presented. In particular, this notion of actually creating a course where there's a beginning and the end, there's assessment modules uh, and facilitation throughout. So, so let me start with uh, what the scope is and really what I see as the, the greatest benefit of these MOOCs, and, and that is the, the global reach you can have with a course like this. Uh, I had over 91,000 students sign up for my course. Uh, to put that in perspective, at the Darden School, which has been around for over 50 years, our entire alumni base is about 15,000. So in one day, I had taught six times the entire history of Darden's students, assuming all of those that actually watched the videos. Uh, the breadth geographically is amazing. 120 countries represented for those who completed the course, not just signed up for the course, 120 different countries represented in those who actually completed the course. I had encouraged my students to form study groups. Um, many of them did that virtually, but actually many of them did that physically as well. So they would get together. It was funny, if you looked at New York, there was one in the Upper West Side and one uh, downtown and the like. Overall, we counted 50 countries having study groups, including Zimbabwe, Mongolia, Bangladesh, Bolivia, Armenia, and you can keep going down, going down the list. So once again, incredible breadth that you can have with these courses. Uh, I just wanted to share with you some of the use cases. Uh, one of the things you see on the, the discussion forums, I'd be emailed by students about some of the unique ways and reasons they were taking the course. So mine is a business uh, course. It's uh, Foundations of Business Strategy. Uh, I had hundreds if not thousands of entrepreneurs taking the course uh, as a way to improve their own ventures and to improve the strategies of their ventures. One of the unique things we did and tried is that at the end of the course, there was a final project. It was a strategic analysis of an organization of your choosing. And we encouraged other organizations to enroll in the course and encourage students to do an analysis of their firm, business, or organization. And we ended up with over 2,000 nonprofits and small businesses who worked with students to do an analysis of their organization, once again, using the course and the platform. Uh, other uh, examples here, I had a former student of mine contact me and inform me that in his consulting firm they had 40 associates, younger uh, new hires, taking my course and meeting regularly and applying the concepts to client uh, cases that they had in their business. Uh, I had a current Darden student, interestingly enough, uh, uh, contact me and let me know that he was taking the course, which he had already taken before in a real live uh, standpoint, just to hone his skills a little, a little better, which I thought was very interesting. I had professors from Temple, Central Michigan, and about a half dozen others contact me to inform me that they were having their students take my course on Coursera and then meet regularly to discuss and get credit from them, and I think a few of us here have had that experience. And those are the ones who contacted me. I'm not sure how many others were out there uh, doing that. I was just at a conference uh, a couple days ago, and a newly minted PhD who will be a faculty uh, said, I was one of your students, uh, and she was taking my course to be able to kind of figure out how she's gonna teach strategy in, in her school. 
I had a Peace Corps volunteer contact me who was leading a discussion group in Mongolia uh, and had some fascinating observations about how the course worked and the like in that, in that unique context. Um, I had students taking part in the course who were part of something called the Yala Young Leaders Program, which brings together students from Israel and Palestine to work together on courses, but really as a way to really bridge the gap there between those, uh, those two groups of people. Uh, so they were taking my course. I had a 12-year-old taking my course, uh, a 12-year-old entrepreneur who reached out to me, who was taking, uh, taking the course. In fact, I, I did look into this one, did a little Google search. He had been on like the Today Show and had gotten a lot of uh, publicity for his 12-year-old uh, business that he, uh, the 12-year-old who had a business that he created. Um, I had a woman who had uh, um, a disability that prevented her from basically enrolling in school and going to uh, actual live classes, uh, who was just so uh, thankful uh, that she had this opportunity to take a MOOC and take online education because she otherwise really didn't have access to uh, higher ed. And one of the most interesting ones, I had a student email me apologizing because she had fallen behind in the coursework for the last couple of weeks because she was temporarily homeless. She had just found herself in a situation where she could no longer, no longer had a home, um, but had gotten herself back on her feet and, and had internet access again and was taking the course again. Uh, and and uh, another exciting one that I saw was a student who uh, midway through the course emailed me to let me know that he was interviewing for a job, he had applied the concepts we had learned in the course, and he had actually gotten the job right on the spot. So uh, this just gives you a sampling, and, and this is where it's the most rewarding. You, you see the diversity again of who's taking the course, how they're using it, how they're applying it. Uh, it is truly amazing, the, the impact. All right, so, so let's talk a little more about the kind of the, the nuts and bolts here and, and, and my thinking on how well it works and doesn't work at the end of the day. When I think about a course, I think about three main areas that we can think about what we're trying to achieve. Dissemination, dissemination of knowledge, facilitation uh, of the students, and then assessment. On the dissemination piece, I think this is where the MOOCs are obviously the most powerful. Uh, as was lied up here, you know, the ability to create course materials, uh, lectures and the like, and to disseminate them to the students in an asynchronous fashion when they can consume them, very, very powerful. Uh, it is very interesting to see how quickly the standards in the terms of these videos and lectures are, are rising very, very quickly. We can talk more about that maybe in, in Q&A. Uh, the second piece, facilitation. So once again, I come from a world where we teach through the case method. It is all about facilitation and exchange. Not anywhere near that. Not anywhere near can we achieve that. With that said, I did have the students do case discussions and use the discussion forums to discuss various business cases. It exceeded my expectations but I also had incredibly low expectations going in on this. What you will find is there's this very skewed distribution. There were some small numbers of students who were very active in the discussions, who did a great job. I was actually impressed by the level and detail of analysis that they did. There's another very, very large group who are discussion room voyeurs. They sit there, they read, they look, but they don't actively participate. And then, of course, there are many others who seemingly don't, don't actually participate in those forums. I, I likened it to being a faculty member going into the classroom, asking a question of the students, telling them to discuss, leaving the classroom, getting just brief snippets of what they're saying, and then going back in the classroom to give a wrap-up at the end of the day. So it's a very different experience for a faculty used to the give and take and exchange that you have in the classroom. Once again, exceeded my expectations, but in no way is it even close to what we can do in a facilitated discussion in a classroom. Uh, the last piece was assessment. Uh, and, and I have to say, this is probably the biggest pain point I had in the course. Um, there are these certificate of accomplishments the students can get. I think we, we all uh, gave certificates of accomplishments if they achieved a certain level in the course. In my course, I had a mix of quizzes. There were weekly quizzes they had to take place. And then there was this final project that they had to do. So one of the observations is, for all of you out there who teach, no matter what we do and how well we describe things, there will always be that student or students who misread the assignment, miss the due date, perhaps has the dog eat the homework. Now you multiply that by 91,000. So now you suddenly have thousands of students who missed the due date, the dog ate their homework, they've all got an excuse. 
the way the Coursera platform works, you have to give a due date. And so the due date for mine was due at midnight, Greenwich Mean Time, Greenwich Mean Time. So many students missed that, despite it being very clear and it was told to them that they had to be aware of that. My favorite was an email I received from a student, frantic because she missed the final assignment due date. She lived on the East Coast and she had submitted it by 8 p.m. because she knew it was due midnight, Greenwich Mean Time. It's a five hour time difference, not a four hour time difference. So she missed the deadline. The platform, in all candor, is not very robust at this point. Very hard to deal with these types of problems. And to be honest with you, with the scale we're at and the number of students we're talking about, you somewhat just have to let these things go. And, and so I found that as one, like I said, one of the bigger pain points. The other piece of this was I uh, did, again, a final project. Again, I am not going to grade thousands and thousands of these final projects. So we use the peer assessment function on Coursera, where, as the name suggests, their peers would grade them. I was worried about this, the students were worried about this. It worked fairly well, but I need to see more data before I'm convinced of what Coursera says, that it's highly correlated with the faculty, the faculty assessment. One particular challenge with the peer assessment was plagiarism. Uh, lots of discussions on the discussion forums about students who had plagiarized all or part of their assignments. Uh, I purposefully did not engage in those discussions because I could see that if I entered in and tried to clarify what is and isn't plagiarism, that I would have thousands and thousands of additional emails asking for additional clarification on this. There's some real, real challenges I feel with the assessment if you move away from well, like what you see in some of the STEM courses where it's just straight up multiple choice quiz or projects and the like. And so I think that's something we need to think about when we move forward with these types of, of MOOCs and the like. So let me just end by saying once again, to me, the beauty of these, the really appealing thing as an instructor was the ability to reach thousands and thousands of students distributed to the world who are using these in really, really powerful ways. It goes to our core mission as educators. The technology is developing. It's developing fast. There are still some real limitations with technology, um, but there's some real, some real promise as well. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Maybe you'll get it now, Mitch, who's got to be running the largest philosophy class in the world. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. So my name is Mitch Green again. I'm from the Department of Philosophy here. And I taught a course called Know Thyself, which began on March 4th, is running for 10 weeks. And so I'm just about to go into week 10 this coming week. And I'll be making it over the finish line, but not with a whole lot of extra energy to spare. Um, but because of uh, a number of requests, not too different from the spirit that probably motivated the ones that Michael discussed, I've pushed back the deadline for another week. So it's actually going to not close till May. 18th. Um, uh, so the enrollment for this course was about a little under 75,000 people, but that's a misleading number. Then the, you have to ask the question, how many people are actually taking the quizzes? How many people are doing the work? And that looks to me from the statistics that I can see on the course kind of admin page to be about 12,000, which is still a robust number as far as I can tell. And very exciting for me that there were over 100 countries represented, ages between um, 15 and 85. One of the students in the class actually created a thread saying, where are you from? How old are you, et cetera? And then counted all the answers. That was helpful. And, and and, and the course was um, starting out with Western philosophy, including Plato, Descartes, and Gilbert Ryle. They moved on to psychoanalysis, some contemporary social psychology. We actually read work by our own Tim Wilson, uh, neuroscience, and then ended up, the course changed names from K-N-O-W, thyself, to N-O, space, thyself, because we talked about the Buddhist doctrine that the self is a fiction. And so that's what we've been doing for the last couple of weeks. We also incorporated into the video lectures every week, each week of the 10 weeks, I would have essentially two lectures, which would each of them be broken down into segments of about five to 10 minutes, roughly, I think not too dissimilar from what Philip was talking about. And at the beginning of each one of the, each, each of the two main lecture com composites of a given week, I'd have a little thing I'd call meditative moment where I'd sit with a little singing bowl somewhere appropriate, if at all possible, when the weather permitted and so forth, on grounds, generally speaking, in a nice pavilion garden or in front of the rotunda, or in the case in which I was talking about Socrates when he was on trial with his fellow Athenians, I did that in the amphitheater behind Cock Hall. And we would have a little meditative moment or just a couple of minutes, three or four or five minutes, listen to the ringing of the singing bowl and ask, ask students to engage in a little bit 
bit of meditation, some breathing, some visual, visualization, something of the kind. People responded to that very positively. So they didn't have to, you could have clicked past that particular segment, moved on to the actual content if you wanted to, but people seemed to like that a great deal. And as I say, whenever possible, I would, I would do my lectures outside uh, just because I prefer in general to be outside rather than inside even when it's when it's cold And so you could see with some of the lectures that were done in early March that I would start you could clear It was clear that I was beginning to get hypothermic as we got into the to the last part of the of the lecture But that was okay. In one case I sat next to the fire pit on the, the deck behind my house and warmed myself next to the fire as it as it glowed and and students seemed to respond very positively to the Environment I think it was kind of a free easy advertising for the physical grounds of the university as well as for the beauty of this of this part of the state and and many people commented that they felt that that it seemed wonderful to them that they could that could do these lectures outside and they felt connected with nature and it was kind of it occurred to me that many of the students in the class must be living in you know enormous concrete jungles because people would start threads like did you see that squirrel that ran behind professor green's left shoulder that was amazing it's like, wow <laughs> great uh, you hang out on my lawn for long enough, you'll see possums and bears and so forth. So, so, so I was, it was a fairly easy bar to get over in terms of impressing the audience, but, but that was fine. And, I, and many of you have seen me around grounds with my, with my ginormous brown Newfoundland dog, and she made appearances in the, in the videos as well, and now she's some kind of international star. This one thread, Clementine is so beautiful and so forth, and it does add a little bit of comic relief. So when, when we were in Sugar Hollow a couple weekends ago doing an early morning uh, video, uh, uh, she had jumped into the, the reservoir, and then while I'm sitting there trying to talk about something about Zen, the Zen practice of archery, she's behind me on the grass, flailing around, drying herself off with her paws rolling, you know, in in the air, so that got a lot of a lot of comments. And again, one of my main points, and what I felt like one of, one of the main challenges I wanted to, to to try to face was making a connection with the person on the other side of the screen, so to speak. So I tried to visualize an office worker in Kuala Lumpur who's on her her, her lunch break, and maybe she'll try to get a little of the Coursera course that she's taking knocked knocked off. But given what happens on a person's screen between Facebook and all the YouTube videos that you've been hearing hearing about and so forth. There's a lot of competition for airspace, so for airtime. So I wanted to think of ways to, as it were, jump out from the screen as much as possible. And I figured, yeah, I'm not too, I'm, I'm not too proud to stoop to the use of my dog to help with that kind of thing. So, so that's what I did, and I think it actually worked out fairly well. And and so I've got an, an upcoming. I'll, I just um, did the last video lecture yesterday, and I'll be doing a. A, a kind of informal lecture this afternoon, if all goes well, which I'll have, and I'll talk about these in a moment, my community TAs have a conversation with me. That will be filmed, and then that will be part of the content for week 10. And then after that, given that we've extended the course by a little bit, I'm going to invite students in the class to engage in a kind of Google Hangout, which if you haven't seen before, is kind of like Skype, but you can get 10 people on the screen rather than just two. And so I'm hoping that what I'm gonna do is, I've created a, a Gmail account, that's just for this course. I'll ask students that want to to write to the course, write to that write to that account. Tell me what roughly what question they would like to ask, and what country they're from, and maybe what time zone would be suitable for them. And then think about a couple of different Google Hangouts that we can engage in, and then those will be recorded while they're happening, and then the recording will be posted on the class the class website for students to watch. I, I don't think that we'll be determining that we should be talking about something specific by way of helping people to study for the, the quizzes that they might not have done yet, but I'm hoping it'll be more of a kind of free-ranging discussion that will leave open some of the questions of a synoptic kind that might connect people's thought about Socrates' claim that the unexamined life is not worth living back from week one in March to contemporary discussions about, about the neuroscientific basis of the emotions, for example, if people can draw big connections that will make me especially happy, well, we'll just have to see, see how it goes. By way of the sort of nuts and bolts of the assessment involved in the class, I decided, following some 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 warnings, some concerns that Philip had raised, for example, to forego the the, the peer assessment route and just do nothing but quizzes. So I've got 10 quizzes, one quiz for each week. The standard is just, if you want to get a certificate of completion, you need to get a 70% average on, on all the quizzes, all told, and and to, to that end, you can drop the lowest score. We we think that we'll be able to make that work technically, although Michael makes me a little bit nervous about whether that will be implemented. We'll just have to see, I guess. And 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 um, I found that writing quizzes, remember this is a no, there's no admission standards for Coursera. Anybody in the world can walk in. And, and in many cases, it, might be adults who've been out of school, college, or maybe they never, never went to college and want to try to try to go to go to Coursera in some sense and 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 make up for some of the lacunae in their education. There's a huge amount of variety in terms of people's preparation for dealing with what we consider to be higher education. And so some of the questions, some of the posts that I saw on the discussion forum were, I should say, surprising. <laughs> 
for me, given what I had just spent the last hour and a half talking about in the lecture, and the thought is someone wasn't listening very carefully to what I was saying, or didn't bother to do the reading very carefully. So I had to think hard about what the kind of audience I was dealing with, and in many cases I found the first few quizzes seemed to me to be pretty straightforward, and I'm sure that my on-grounds undergraduates wouldn't have had much trouble with them, but they caused a certain amount of consternation among the, the Coursera students because they thought that they, many felt the questions were too subtle. I didn't think so, but I ha I've had to kind of dial back the subtlety of some of the questions in order to make it accessible to more students. That's just part of the learning. I haven't given a quiz in 20 years of my time teaching at the university here. So, so this writing a quiz and making it accessible for this crowd was a new thing for me, and I think I've still got a lot to learn, but I think I've got a little bit better at it as the, as the, this, the term has progressed. I had to face the question, what should I do about readings? Because I was hesitant to make anybody, to, to make any readings required insofar as at least there weren't, there weren't readings that were appropriate for this course, there weren't enough of them that were freely available online. So I had to decide whether I was going to make any readings required, and then that raised the question, well, Coursera tends to counsel people, I don't think they demand this, but they counsel instructors not to make anybody buy books. The whole idea is to make ex education as, as free and open as possible. And I was also worried about even if you, if you live in Kuala Lumpur, can you, can you have Amazon deliver there? I don't know what, what, what availability is there. Yeah. I suppose you can get things, good to know, I suppose you can get things on Kindle and so forth, but I still decided to not make any, not make any, any readings required. I just did as much as I could to track down online sources for PDF files of various kinds, and that worked reasonably well, and I had the sense that most people were doing most of the readings, but I couldn't be absolutely sure. I still think there's more that we can and should do by way of making substantial readings available but copyright, as, as, as we all know, is a potentially huge headache, and we really have to be careful with, with uh, not falling afoul of what publishers want to make available to, to the world. Um, uh, I, I found really ex inspiring, for the most part, exciting, and a lot of work, the online discussion fora. There were, I, I looked at the statistics, there were something like over 1,500 threads and something like 20 or 30,000 posts and maybe something more like 50,000 views of those posts. So there's just a huge number of people who are writing about the, responding to the material, and in some cases, in some cases, anonymously or not, responding to the material in ways that bring in some personal experience that can be very helpful. So for example, at one point we talked about the, the, the gruesome case of Phineas Gage, the railroad worker in the 19th century who had a pole shot through his head, and, and there's been a lot of speculation as to precisely what went wrong with him afterwards, he, because he did live, he did survive for a few years after that, and there are current cases that the neuroscientist Antonio Damasio has discussed, and then someone posted, well, my son has a lesion in his brain just like this, and let me tell you about his behavioral response to it. That was striking and powerful and lots, made lots of people engage in ways that I wouldn't have expected. Likewise, there are cases that we discussed in the neuroscience literature of people who are seriously and profoundly depressed, and, and we talked, some of the people were, were willing to post their own experiences or experiences of people that they knew about, and then other people jumped into the discussion and had very helpful things to say. So in many respects, that was inspiring. It was just exciting to see people engaging with the material in a way that showed that they were thinking hard about it. They were, they were trying to take it to heart. They were considering you know, possible objections to the views that, I, that, that, we were, that we were floating. And I was trying to make a point that with every author that I discussed, each including the, the, the famous people for whom there are pedestals built and, and statues and so forth, Descartes and Plato and, 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 and Pascal and many others, I wanted to make a point of disagreeing with each of them in at least one place. That is to say, granted, this is what Plato said, but, but that doesn't make it true. Let's think about whether or not there's a reasonable objection that somebody might have to, for example, Socrates' claim that the unexamined life is not worth living. Is that really true? I mean, think about it. If you don't examine your life, you shouldn't have been born. It seems kind of high-handed if you think about it. So you've heard that kind of thing before, but there's something to debate there. So I tried to get that discussion going, and sure enough, within a couple of hours of posting the video, there was somebody from Lima debating with someone from Kazakhstan, debating with someone from Minneapolis about whether Socrates is right or wrong on the question whether the unexamined life was not worth living, and, and following what our previous speakers said, that was just inspiring and exciting and made me feel that there's just a huge amount of power of a, of, in harnessing a kind of global intellectual community. So that was just a lot of fun. By way of contrast with what Philip did, I didn't flip my classroom, but I guess I'd say following a, following a metaphor I, I'm stealing from Juliet um, Trail is I, I tilted it in the following sense. I, I, my traditional on-grounds class, 120 students over in Minor Auditorium, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 11 to, to 11.50, Know Thyself, was 
was was the was was carried out traditionally. But I invited all students who wanted to, and they would get a greater participation credit if they did so, to become community TAs in the course in the Coursera course. And so what that enabled them to do was we would meet every week, talk about the issues, talk about the the content if they had any questions about it, and then they would go forth and wade into the online discussion fora and make comments, answer questions, try to redirect discussion in a more helpful way in some cases. And in those cases in which they couldn't answer questions themselves, they would send me an email saying, hey, Mitch, I don't know how to answer this question about this particular point about social psychology. Say, could you please go and see if you can help out? And they'd send me the link, and I'd click on that link, and I'd get to that point in the otherwise very difficult to navigate search through discussion fora and, and try to do the best I could. And so the students, my thought was, you learn a lot by trying to teach it to somebody else. And I believe the students that were engaged in this did learn a lot more. These are certainly among the, the best students in my class. Didn't learn a lot more by having to explain to a perfect stranger who might be, who might be on another continent what Descartes meant by clear and distinct perception, for example, or, or, or what this idea that there's no such thing as a self could actually poss could, could possibly mean. So I thought that was very helpful. The, the numbers for the number of, of students that were engaged as community GAs was relatively small. I believe there were six who were involved in this out of a whole class of 120. So there was not that much, that much uptake from the class. But I believe if I were to do this again, I'd probably get more if, if I were to go into it with a firmer sense about what the student in the on-grounds course would be able to have. But also in some cases, the, the the inf information went in the other direction. So in a couple of cases, I'd come to class here in, at, at, at Minder Hall and say, hey, you know, somebody last weekend on the discussion forums for the course raised the following question. And it was a good question. Let's talk about it for a little bit. Or and even some of the study questions that I posed in, for my on-grounds course, I always have have study questions that grow in size as we approach the midterm and the final exam. And students know that the midterm and final exam will just be based on those study questions and nothing else. And in some cases, I modified my discussion questions, my study questions, in light of what people had posted on the online forum. So the, so the interaction was two-way, and I think it was very helpful in that respect. So that's what I meant by flipping, uh, sorry, tilting, and I think that went, went reasonably well. Um, some of the issues, it certainly is true that on the online discussion for a, there were some people who wanted to use those as a, as a soapbox. People wanted to express, espouse their own philosophical view about the nature of life, meditation, self-knowledge, Plato, death, whatever, and, and in some cases espousing some religious views. In a couple of cases, I had to weigh in and say, you know, this is the kind of position that you might want to just keep to yourself for now. Maybe we can get back to it later. In a couple of cases where I thought the discussion was downright inappropriate, I just had to delete. In one case, where a poster was downright rude to other people and using inappropriate language and so forth, we asked Coursera to contact that person saying something to effect of. If you continue on, you will just be booted from this course, so please don't continue on with that kind of language. And so far as we can tell, the problem went away, so that was good. But you do have to be, we, I, find, I found that we did have to be vigilant about what was happening in the discussion for either myself or the community TAs helping out, because one just never knows how, how, how things can go. And I think in some, some cases, I feel like if we had not if we had not sort of turned, done something to prevent the invective that was growing, the level of vituperation that was growing in the discussion for it might have gotten much worse. So I'm glad we were able to step in. So that was some of the issues I was as I said before, decided to refrain from doing the peer assessments. I was kind of skittish about that. But like Michael, I'd very much like to just follow the discussion about w the ways in which peer assessment can be made to work. Because it seems to me, if we're going to get anywhere near having humanities classes be used in a way that could end up on somebody's transcript someday or something like it, then we're going, I think, to have to do more than just, just quizzes, multiple choice or other kinds of quizzes. Now, I don't claim to be any kind of expert about the the resources that we have for online assessment that are less writing involved and more involved in various kinds of quiz-like things. But for the humanities, I'm not sure that that would be applicable even if we had them. But I'm willing to listen to both sides of the conversation. It might be that there are ways of making quizzes that are really challenging, really substantial, and that really assess your understanding of Descartes. I don't know how to do it myself, but I don't want to rule out the possibility uh, either. And so I'd be very eager to hear, to hear what people have to say about that. But at the same time, I think that there's, so far as I know, there's absolutely no substitute for asking student to write, a student to write something, to engage in written form with a complex and sometimes subtle philosophical idea or any other idea that you find in the humanities or elsewhere. And so it looks like, given that we're not going to have the ability to actually grade 75,000 such essays, something like peer assessment is going to have to happen. Um, and the question is how to make that work well. Maybe there's a way in which the only way to be a peer assessor in the first place is to go through a kind of battery of, of tests of a certain kind in the first part of the course. I'm not sure how that would go. I've also read um, that some companies purport to have sort of on, automatic ways of, of assessing 
written dis, written text. I don't know how the, how that could possibly be, but I don't want to say anything a priori and yet blamed as blamed for being philosophical about what what artificial intelligence is capable of, of doing. So I'd like to hear more. I'd like to learn more about what those possibilities are, because after all, in some sense, we are only finite machines ourselves, and there must be some finite basis on which we are able to process and produce language. And I would have thought that if you've got a big enough computer, maybe you could get that to come pretty close as well. So who knows? Maybe that possibility should be should be kept open. So by way of sort of prospects that I see for a course like this, as well as similar kinds of courses, um, I you know have sometimes imagined a kind of you can almost imagine a kind of iTunesification of higher education in five or ten after we've gotten out of the trough five or ten years perhaps in which a student who's at uh, a traditional brick and mortar university might still very much enjoy the opportunity to in some sense, take a class, suppose she's in Wisconsin, but she'd love to be able to take that class on film history from UCLA and that other class on the American Civil War and the Civil War from, 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 from Virginia and then a class in, in macroeconomics from MIT without having to leave where she is on that campus in Wisconsin. And those would actually show up on her transcripts. So, so is there a way to make that happen that would be credit worthy and, and one model might be something like the model that we have for AP tests, AP credit, where no university is is, is determined to accept AP credit, universities can decide on their own terms how much an AP class actually accounts for them. And that an analog of that might be useful for, for the Coursera and like models as well. I would also like to see various ways in which we could kind of decrease tourism, as it were. When you've got 75,000 people signing up for a course, but only 12,000 engaged actively, I have this feeling that there must be a lot of I don't know, associate vice provosts of something somewhere sitting around kind of watching but not getting in engaged in the class because they're curious about whether uni their university will, will be involved in that someday. And that's fine, but I guess I would like just as, you know, when, I have, when somebody asks me if they can audit my course here on grounds, I say, fine, but no tourists. You've got to do the reading and I'm going to call on you just like I would any other class. You just aren't going to get credit for taking the class um, like, like any other student. And, and that tends to deter some people. Likewise, I'd like people to, to enroll in the Coursera courses to do so with some willingness to commit themselves to it as opposed to just to hang out and watch. Um, and I, th I think we might also think usefully about filling out the sort of uneven, what I consider to be the kind of uneven course offerings that Coursera has right now, at least in the humanities side. For example, there's, you'll see courses like Aboriginal Views on Education, which sounds fascinating to me, but there's not a single course in the humanities listing for, on ethics. Not a single course on ethics, which is just kind of amazing. So, so if it looks like you know universities are allowed to just kind of do what they want to, which is fine. But I think more universities could be more more activist about what the world could use and what they could fill in and 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 make available to to students. So, so I think there are a lot of exciting opportunities. Just because there are a lot of courses out there doesn't mean there aren't a lot of lacunae that are there to be filled in. It seems to me there are a great many of those. But the the, the crucial thing for me was that in trying this course, trying this experiment, I wanted to see whether I could engage philosophically, that is, that is get, get students from around the world to begin to ask themselves questions of the form, given these big, heavy, heady beliefs that I have and I hear other people espousing, what do they mean? Can we understand them more fully? Can we get, dig more deeply into them? Get a better sense of what they're presupposing, for example, what their commitments are that they bring in, firstly. And secondly, now that we've made some con progress on what they mean, can we get a better sense of whether or not we have justified reasons for believing them to be true? What is the basis for these things? All too often, philosophy turns into a kind of slugfest of doctrines. And I think once it's done that, it has not been very, very, very useful for the students and others involved. So what I tried very much to do in this course was to reach out as far as I could to touch as many people as I could with the idea just because Plato said it doesn't make it true, just because it's a famous doctrine doesn't mean, doesn't mean you should take, accept it at face value. Rather, let's dig into it and question it and thereby question some of the beliefs that we have that might guide our lives, guide our lives for many, many years without it being subject to any kind of scrutiny in ways that might or might not do us some good. So a lot of what I was trying to achieve was to engage philosophically with people of all, all walks of life from around the world. And I think I was moderately successful with that. I think I've got a whole lot to learn. But insofar as it did work, it was very exciting, very gratifying, very inspiring, and, and something that I hope many others will get a chance to do in the future. Thanks a lot. So we're now going to actually experience part of that world that you get when you're doing a Coursera course, which is the sort of pushed parts done. But our time is very uh, much at an end here. 
Um, so I'll leave it to you to decide. Uh, I know you're, you want to make some reference. I had one more question for everybody, which is the preparation time in advance of the course. And I saw 400 to 600 hours. How about the other two of you? I think, I think that's probably about right. Um, uh, so I did my uh, main lectures were in a studio that we have up at Darden. Uh, so you can think of the normal prep you would have to create a lecture that you would give in the classroom and then to actually go in there and, and film it. With Coursera, the surprising thing to me was, once again, I thought I had it in the bag, but then you realize there's a lot of other moving pieces. And um, it's a higher form of engagement than just kind of putting a bunch of videos on YouTube. So. Similar to Mitch, I, I did like a weekly debrief where I would actually reflect on some of the questions the students had and some of the comments that they had. Um, so that was additional time. There's the participation in the forums themselves, which can take time pretty quickly. Yeah, it's keeping track of the hours. A lot of them, I don't know, about maybe two or 300 for me. I'm not as much of an insane workaholic as people like Philip are. <laughs> I've, I've got a question. Um, so each done this for the first time, right? When you offer the course for the second time, which parts are you gonna reuse? Which parts do you have to do again new for this one, the second offering? Um, what I'll do is uh, reuse most of it. Um, we actually have made all through the course what we call a punch list, borrowing the term from builders. Um, partly in discussion forums, which are very interesting. Folks, uh, I've been doing modern world history. This is a minefield in, for a worldwide audience. And people are following what I say. Somebody, if I, the slightest factual error about anything in the world, someone will post on that. And so um, we're, uh, so I have like a punch list, uh, you know, variety of things that I want that we, we're going to go back and fix or adjust some things we want to do in improving the animations and so on. So we will basically refine, clean up, revise, but leave the basic material intact. Um, the response to the students on my course was uh, so positive that uh, both on the style and the basic way the substance was presented that kind of afraid to mess with it. Much less. So it, you're, uh, I don't, and I don't know how uh, what it will be. It'll, you know, be coming during the summer, and there's ongoing and running it again, including in the flipped classroom mode, monitoring the discussion forum, and the like. Which this time around, I did the discussion forums myself. Much. I asked my TAs in my residential class to go to work on the discussion forums, or to do any work on the Coursera side. I, my court assistant helped me with but um, it, but not nearly as much, in other words. Now, from, from a, because I'm also a dean and involved a little bit in management of these exercises, from a broader university perspective, I think the ideal would be is if you end up getting a good one of these together on an, on an important course, um, I, the university would like to turn that into a living object of some kind. Very heavy front costs, but rather than basically just punching a button each time, you do various revisions. I will do some revisions in the transcripts, for example, which the first round machine generated and which students have found invaluable, especially if this is not their native language. Um, and if I have the money, I transcript the transcripts, but that's very expensive. But what you might do, imagine, let's say, two, three, four years from now, and Everyone agrees that Zellico really is a st stale commodity. And we need to get some other different and better historians involved in this. You can imagine that there becomes a UVA course in which other professors basically be picking up the material. They begin substituting some of their presentations. And this actually becomes a living collective object in which, in effect, a rolling team of UVA professors are delivering this material a proven standard. So just for the fun, you can have futures that uh, could even be quite scary for us. So 